Several European states, including the United States, uh, went to the United Nations uh, to get authorization uh, to impose a no-fly zone over Libya uh, to prevent the government uh, from attacking protesters in Benghazi. Uh, and uh, that resolution went through. Uh, it went through. Uh, it was, uh, as I recall, uh, the Chinese and the Russian governments abstained. Uh, the Russian government had to voted for it. Uh, but the basic idea of it was uh, that um, the resolution only authorized uh, the imposition of a no-fly zone uh, and preventing a humanitarian disaster. But there was no mention of uh, regime change or any more extensive uh, military action within Libya. Um, from the outset, however, uh, there were problems with this. Uh, and one of the problems that was uh, pointed to uh, by uh, the then Secretary of Defense of the United States, uh, Robert Gates, uh, was that Robert Gates on one of the uh, Sunday morning t uh, talk shows um, basically said, well, lots of people think that this is really easy, that uh, all we have to do is impose a fly zone, that nobody has to get hurt, and we'll restrain the uh, the uh, Gaddafi government, I and mean, the protesters can do what they want. Uh, but it's not that simple. Uh, the imposition of a no-fly zone, uh, as he pointed out, first and foremost requires taking out the country's air defenses, uh, meaning uh, that uh, essentially imposing a no-fly zone requires an act of war. Uh, and once you've engaged in that act of war, um, where does it stop? Uh, and indeed, uh, the engagement, once it, began, or once it uh, began, mostly under French and Canadian uh, leadership, interestingly, the U.S. Uh, took a backseat in the command structures of that mission, although 80% of the hardware used uh, in the mission was uh, American-made, uh, American-owned. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, it ultimately, as most of you are aware, uh, led to uh, Qaddafi's ouster and overthrow. Uh, something that was not intended uh, by many of those in the Security Council that voted to authorize it. Uh, and this is one of the reasons uh, why a similar uh, measure failed to succeed in the United Nations uh, in the much more appropriate case of Syria, uh, where the levels of atrocities uh, being committed by the Syrian government uh, were far, uh, far more extensive. Uh, but in this case, uh, both China and, uh, and uh, uh, Russia, uh, feeling that they'd been burned by uh, the Western powers uh, the first time around, refused to participate. Uh, and that led to the kind of a deadlock uh, uh, in uh, international interventions uh, in Syria. Um, in this regard, Supranational law uh, with respect to human rights uh, certainly is beginning to, uh, to supersede uh, domestic law and sovereignty. But there's strong indications uh, that there are other components of international problems uh, that will raise similar types of issues. Most notably, uh, the environment, which we'll talk about in more detail in a few minutes. Uh, and the requirements for dealing with climate change. Uh, both of those make the actions of states within their borders very much relevant uh, to those outside of their borders. Uh, and we have an environment where the international community certainly has an incentive uh, to intervene in countries uh, that are unwilling to abide by uh, the international agreements uh, to limit the uh, production of greenhouse gases, uh, and various other environmental uh, problems that we'll address in a few minutes. Uh, beyond that, uh, in regard to supranational law, uh, or the transition between international law uh, and supranational law, uh, the 19, uh, 1864 Geneva Conventions uh, are a good example of something that supersedes sovereignty. Uh, the Geneva Conventions were essentially created to regulate uh, the treatment of prisoners of war. And to do so, they created an international organization, uh, the International Committee of the Red Cross, uh, to monitor uh, uh, compliance with the Geneva Conventions, uh, meaning uh, that any country that defines itself at war uh, and uh, takes, uh, takes uh, prisoners of war is required to treat them humanely, uh, meaning that to provide the necessities of life, uh, that they have to be immune uh, from uh, any kind of interrogation, uh, and uh, of course from various other forms of cruelty, uh, like uh, torture and so on and so forth. And to make sure that states abide by this, 
essentially the states uh, under this convention agree to allow the International Committee of the Red Cross to monitor prisoner of war camps to make sure that they are compliant uh, with those uh, basic safeguards uh, of uh, prisoners of war. Again, uh, how exact is this? Uh, and uh, how uh, meaningful is it? Uh, this was put to a test, and I don't mean to pick on the United States in this regard particularly, but it was put to the test in the global war on terror, uh, where, as you may recall, uh, the United States, of course, did take prisoners of war, uh, and a number of those prisoners of war uh, were not um, prisoners of war that were taken in the context of the war, uh, but rather, uh, in some cases, rendered uh, from other parts of the world uh, where uh, terrorist suspects uh, were found. Um, and again, uh, there, there's a major problem. Uh, the global war on terror was declared uh, in Afghanistan and in Iraq, uh, but as the term global war on terror uh, suggests, uh, the uh, scope of that war was from the outset understood by the Bush administration and subsequently by the Obama administration to go beyond those uh, theaters. Uh, in other words, anywhere in the world uh, there could be uh, terrorist al-Qaeda members hiding out, and all of them are the enemy, and all of them uh, therefore are relevant, tar relevant targets for American action. Um, the prisoners of war that were taken overwhelmingly uh, in, the, uh, in Afghanistan to begin with uh, were generally not Afghanis. Uh, they tended to be foreign fighters, and were for that reason assumed to be uh, members of al-Qaeda. Um, and were generally not made to, kept in uh, Afghanistan, uh, but transferred to other prisoners prisons elsewhere. Uh, most notably, of course, in Guantanamo Bay. And uh, the International uh, Committee of the Red Cross, on repeated occasions, attempted to gain access uh, to uh, the uh, prison camp in, in uh, Guantanamo Bay, and was always rejected. Um, anyone know why they were rejected? Why the United States wouldn't let them in? Uh, exactly. Uh, they weren't actually prisoners of war. Uh, they were instead illegal combatants. And again, there is some justification for that. Uh, it's not uh, that they pulled this out of uh, thin air. Uh, essentially, uh, the Geneva Conventions were written at a time uh, when wars were wars between uh, two organized military establishments uh, in which all combatants were uniform and fit into a uh, chain of command. Uh, Al-Qaeda obviously doesn't work that way. Uh, a, nobody wears a uniform. Uh, and B, uh, they are not authorized by a state to do anything. Uh, they are non-state actors. And for that reason are illegal combatants, according to uh, the Bush administration. And for that reason uh, do not enjoy the same rights as prisoners of war uh, elsewhere. Uh, now that doesn't necessarily uh, justify uh, what, was, uh, what happened to them in Guantanamo Bay. Uh, basically, uh, one of the reasons why the United States established Guantanamo Bay where it is, uh, is because it's outside of the United States. If they were inside the United States, the U.S. Constitution was, is very, fairly clear. Uh, anyone that is detained inside the United States has uh, what is known as the right of habeas corpus, uh, meaning the right to contest uh, their detention uh, and uh, to uh, do so in, the, in a court of law uh, with a jury and so on and so forth. Uh, the American government was very keen not to give these folks access to American courts and essentially assumed that since the prison camp was in Guantanamo Bay, which is in Cuba, and not in the United States proper, uh, they were beyond the reach of American courts and beyond the reach of uh, the International Committee uh, uh, of the Red Cross uh, in a kind of no man's land. And of course, many of them would remain there to this day. Uh, Ultimately, uh, for those of you interested in uh, American law, uh, the Supreme Court rejected that on three different occasions in the U.S., uh, arguing that uh, since the United States exercises control over Guantanamo Bay, uh, the uh, claim that it's not on sovereign uh, American soil was meaningless. Uh, in essence, they have no other alternative other than to reach American courts and therefore should be given access to American courts. Um, of course, um, those decisions have so far been uh, ignored uh, by both uh, the Bush administration uh, and the Obama administration. Uh, most of them have not yet received any, uh, any kind of access to courts. And uh, President Bush, who came to power uh, saying that he wanted to get deal with all of this, uh, basically uh, found very quickly upon taking office uh, that he didn't have very many choices uh, open to him in dealing with them, like a few questions said. Uh, the reason why he didn't have many choices open to him is that most of those folks that were detained in Guantanamo Bay uh, were tortured uh, for various forms of confessions. Uh, and one of the requirements of American law is that American courts will not allow any evidence that was derived by court, but by torture uh, to be presented in a court. 
And that meant that all of the evidence that they had against these folks, some of whom may be guilty, but some of whom might not, was by its very nature tainted. And that meant even if they were guilty of sin, they couldn't prove it in court because they couldn't make use of those, uh, those documents or those uh, pieces of evidence. Uh, and uh, they weren't, uh, the, Bush, the Obama administration wasn't about to let these folks off the hook. Uh, and therefore, essentially, he came up with a uh, scheme uh, in which uh, those, mem those uh, officials, those folks that were in Guantanamo Bay against whom they had plenty of evidence uh, that was not tainted by any uh, torture and so on, would be granted access to civilian courts. Uh, in other words, those that the government was sure that they could, 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 could convict uh, regardless. Uh, of uh, uh, any other considerations would be given access to courts. Those that would not be um, convictable in civilian courts would instead be brought to military commissions. Uh, in military commissions, you can bring uh, those kinds of uh, evidence to bear, uh, but this is precisely what the Supreme Court claimed was, Ill was illegitimate. Uh, military courts uh, are meant for uh, members of the military, uh, not for uh, civilians. And finally, uh, for those uh, that uh, they weren't sure could, they could convict either in civilian courts or in military tribunals, they simply wouldn't give them access to courts at all. Um, and that's the position of most of those that remain in Guantanamo to this, to this day. Um, not very legal uh, and not very nice, uh, but nonetheless, uh, that's the situation. Um, let me talk very briefly about uh, another means of making international law uh, and indeed uh, human rights, as we'll see, uh, a little bit more meaningful uh, than it currently is. Since governments tend to be unlikely uh, to enforce international law or necessarily to abide by it, there are a number of what have become known as transnational advocacy networks, and for short, that essentially have as their purpose the enforcement of international law. Now, these transnational advocacy networks, of course, are not capable of enforcing international law. They don't have armies. They don't have anything other than their small staff of researchers and so on. But what they do is that they monitor the activities of states and essentially issue reports to highlight those states where there are major problems uh, in the hope uh, that they can, by doing so, pressure other states in the international community to put pressure on states that are gross violators of, of uh, international law or human rights uh, with the hope of eventually uh, imposing sanctions on them. Short of sanctions and support from the international community, uh, they would hope that negative reports uh, on their governments uh, would at the very, very least uh, force or shame the governments uh, into greater compliance. Uh, with these international laws. Among the more prominent of these kinds of uh, transnational advocacy networks uh, are groups like Human Rights Watch and Amnesty International, uh, both of which focus primarily on human rights violations, uh, and organizations like Greenpeace uh, that uh, do the same with regard to environmental regulations, in particular with the law of the seas and uh, prohibitions on uh, international whaling and things along those lines. Now, uh, yes. Uh, what incentives do oh. states have to allow these uh, networks to be in the country? What incentives do they have? Uh, well, for the most part, um, none uh, is a good way of putting it. Uh, states don't necessarily have an incentive, other than that some states, uh, particular Western states, pride themselves on freedom of speech, freedom of organization, and things along those lines. In other words, they have constitutional guarantees that allow groups like this to function within their borders. Now, most of the countries in the West generally, uh, Western Europe and uh, in North America, um, up until uh, the global war on terror, for the most part didn't want to foul these things either. Uh, and consequently, had uh, every incentive uh, to allow them to operate uh, and to allow them uh, to highlight uh, the violations of human rights uh, in other countries. Uh, but those countries that are at the, uh, uh, at the other end of the spectrum, of those that are regularly accused of, uh, of, uh, uh, of uh, violating human rights, of course have no incentive to allow them in at all and do whatever they can to keep them out. Uh, and in particular in places like Central America uh, during the 1980s, uh, Colombia during the 1980s, 90s, and even to this, to this day, uh, that are gross human rights violators, uh, uh, essentially, um, 
working for Amnesty International in a place like uh, you know, like uh, uh, Colombia is a very dangerous uh, occupation, um, uh, meaning that uh, governments are, are inclined uh, to simply make these people folks disappear uh, in any other manner. Uh, so uh, that's, a, you know, that's a good reason to support organizations like that. Uh, the people that actually do the, foot, uh, the work on the ground uh, do take uh, substantial risks uh, in order to um, better uh, observation of such basic uh, principles of uh, human rights. Um, observance. Just because international law cannot be enforced, uh, it doesn't mean it's entirely meaningless. And many observers have pointed out, and many legal experts have pointed out, uh, that international law is no different than domestic law. In domestic law, it's generally understood uh, that laws become very problematic if not at least 95% of the population of a particular country or city or region will spontaneously observe those laws even without uh, enforcement being necessary. Most laws do not require constant enforcement. Uh, and indeed, for them to require constant enforcement means, means, that they are, means that they are more or less meaningless and that such enforcement uh, is more or less impossible. Uh, think of prohibition during, uh, of alcohol during the 1920s and 30s, for example, or for that matter, prohibition of uh, marijuana uh, nowadays. Um, essentially, uh, those laws uh, are problematic and relatively meaningless, meaningless in that many people smoke pot and most of them don't go to jail. Uh, insofar as the law is enforced, in particular in the United States, it's very unevenly enforced uh, in certain uh, uh, racial categories in certain, certain neighborhoods, but not in others. Uh, in other words, uh, as much as, the, as the college campuses are a hotbed for smoking pot, and uh, every uh, major dorm has uh, many bombs and, uh, in the windows and so on, you very rarely see the police raiding of uh, uh, dormitories. Uh, but, um, you know, a poor uh, black kid uh, caught with a little joint in his pocket that uh, is going to get caught and is going to end up going to jail for it. Uh, so in that sense, uh, it's highly problematic. Uh, and uh, is it really law? Well, we won't go into, into that uh, discussion here. Suffice it to say that the same kind of thing applies with international law. For the most part, international law is based on norms that are spontaneously observed by the vast majority of, of the international community. And insofar as they are not observed, they are become relatively meaningless. But what observation, uh, observation of international law exactly is, uh, is up to debate. Uh, and this is something that I highlighted a few minutes ago uh, with regard to uh, George Bush's uh, torture memos, uh, as well as uh, the intervention in Kosovo. And likewise, uh, we can uh, look at uh, the claims uh, by the Obama administration that the Russian intervention is illegal under international law uh, in the Crimea and that the referendum is illegal under international law as well as unconstitutional uh, as examples of the ambiguities that exist uh, in these kinds of laws. Uh, for the most part, enforcement of international law remains, as your textbook points out, a self-help system, meaning that there is no overall authority that can enforce international law insofar as somebody's sovereignty has been violated, it falls upon their, them to repel those that violated their sovereignty, or to organize alliances that could, to help them to do so. Uh, let me just move on to one other aspect you know, of international law, and that is the law of war. And uh, just war uh, theory. Uh, one of the most important aspects of international law uh, is the laws of war. And indeed, uh, the International Criminal Court, for example, has its origins uh, in enforcing the laws of war. And the laws of war, uh, we might think it's kind of an absurd idea that there's laws of war. Uh, presumably, uh, they, when war begins, uh, the law ended. Uh, and uh, consequently, uh, states do whatever they need to do in order to be, uh, be victorious in war. But it's not always worked that way. And indeed, there's been laws of war uh, for many uh, decades, uh, for many centuries, uh, the origin of this law of war uh, and just war theory uh, is in the Catholic Church. Uh, the Catholic Church became interested in just war theory or just war principles uh, in large part uh, because it had to square a circle <clears throat> that was a little bit difficult to square. 
uh, the Catholic Church, as most of you are aware, uh, is uh, based on, or its teachings are based on the teachings of uh, Jesus Christ and the New Testament of the Bible. And if you um, read the New Testament, uh, and of course uh, people were forbidden from reading the New Testament, it was only published in Latin for uh, most of uh, the history of the Catholic Church, meaning uh, that only the Catholic hierarchy that spoke Latin could interpret the words of Jesus. But if you actually read them yourself, uh, it's pretty unambiguous. Uh, that uh, Jesus Christ was a fairly radical and absolute pacifist. Um, in other words, uh, that his teachings are essentially turning the other cheek uh, and uh, reject all violence. Uh, but, of course, the Catholic Church did not reject all violence and was involved in a number of wars, including things like the Crusades, and therefore had to come up with some way of justifying uh, why their actions were so blatantly contrary to uh, the founder of uh, that religion. And they came up with just more theory. And just for theory, for that reason, uh, has long not been particularly taken seriously by critical observers. Uh, they tend to see it as a rationalization uh, of war uh, rather than as something to eliminate war uh, or to restrict it or to uh, limit its impact. <coughs> but nonetheless, uh, it consists of two different components. The first is what is usually referred to as just ad bello, uh, which refers to just reasons to engage in war, uh, just cause. And I don't want to bore you with a full accounting of, of the complex uh, receipt or, or, or requirements of uh, just and bellum and just war theory. Suffice it to say uh, that one can summarize it by saying that war is justified only when it is defensive, only when it is defense against aggression. Secondly, it is justified only when it is properly authorized. And what is meant by that is that it has to be authorized by the legitimate leader of a legitimate state. Now, why would the Catholic Church care, or why would anyone care about who authorizes it a war? Uh, the thinking behind that is that if it is not authorized by the proper authority, uh, if anyone is authorized to start a war, then it becomes very difficult to stop war. Uh, in other words, who negotiates? Who ends up settling uh, the settling the war? Uh, in order for that to be possible, you have to have the minimum requirement that only those that are legitimately authorized to do so uh, make the decision to go to war, and they are therefore also in a position to bring that war to an end uh, through negotiations and so on. And finally, uh, that war is always the last resort. Now, of course, everyone, including Mr. Putin uh, today, claims that they will only go to war as a last resort. What precisely that means, um, in other words, is a last resort only uh, when, you're, uh, when the troops are already halfway through your territory? Uh, or is it uh, when they're massed on your borders? Or is it when uh, they're starting to organize an army somewhere on the other end of the planet that might sometime in the future uh, uh, attack you? Um, these are important questions, and there's not really any very clear answers. Uh, for the most part, the Department of International Law under the United uh, Nations uh, justifies uh, certainly uh, war uh, when it is a, in response to an act of aggression, uh, meaning an unprovoked attack uh, by one's neighbor. But it also justifies it in preemptive situations, uh, meaning uh, a country doesn't have to wait uh, for the first shot to be fired, if its neighbor is amassing uh, troops on its border, it can take preemptive action uh, to thwart such an attack. Uh, the Bush Doctrine, we interpreted, interpreted that to some extent, uh, in expanding it into a realm uh, that, the, that international law under just war principles, as well as under the UN Charter, was careful to try to avoid. And that is the notion of preventive war. Uh, in essence, the Bush Doctrine, uh, as he enunciated in 2002, uh, is that the United States uh, feels authorized uh, to take actions against countries like Iraq that are not in a position to attack the United States, at least not yet, uh, and simply on the basis that they might in the future at some point develop weapons that could reach the United States uh, or take actions that might attack the United States. And that's highly problematic uh, because essentially in this case uh, the threat remains relatively speculative. Uh, on that basis, the United States might, or any country, uh, could decide, well, I don't like the look of that new leader that was elected over there. He hasn't done anything yet, but uh, that shifty, those shifty eyes just make me sure that he's about to do something messy, uh, and therefore we better take him out. 
Uh, well, that leads to international chaos, uh, and uh, obviously it's not in keeping uh, with uh, the purposes of international law. Um, under the UN, essentially, war is only legitimate if it's into self-defense or if it is sanctioned by the United Nations Security Council. Uh, the second component uh, of international the just war principles or just war theory uh, is what is usually referred to as jus in bello. Jus in bello refers to what it is legal to do within a war once war has started. And in that regard, there are three major components thereof. Uh, one is what kind of weapon uh, weaponry is. Uh, well, before I get to that, the most important component of just in bello uh, is, as I indicated <coughs> here, discrimination. Uh, discrimination and secondly, proportionality, which I failed to put there, but you can add uh, in your own notes. Uh, discrimination re refers to, essentially, the requirement that when a state engages in war, it must do everything possible to limit its actions to having an impact only on those that are legitimate combatants in the war and do everything possible to avoid any civilian casualties. And in this regard, international law is pretty expansive, meaning that it is a war crime to attack even a legitimate target of war, uh, insofar as it is situated in the midst of uh, a civilian population uh, and cannot be attacked without damaging that civilian uh, 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 population. Again, uh, how real is this in terms of actually limiting states? Uh, well, the record of World War II uh, is an indication that it's not very meaningful at all. Uh, but of course, the UN Charter was in effect, but just war principles certainly work. Uh, the just war principles of discrimination would mean that uh, aerial bombardment of major cities is inherently a war crime, uh, because such a bombardment cannot possibly distinguish between combatants and non-combatants, and is bound to result in uh, what uh, currently is being called uh, collateral damage uh, when um, unintentionally uh, civilians are killed when you bomb, bomb drops, uh, in, uh, drop bombs uh, in uh, uh, urban areas uh, such as in Fallujah and Iran and so on. Uh, proportionality, uh, the second component of that requirement uh, is uh, that even if you have been attacked in a war, say uh, your neighbor sent, uh, in the case of India-Pakistan uh, conflict, uh, sent a, a battalion of troops into Kashmir. India is not, therefore, uh, authorized uh, to drop, drop nuclear weapons uh, on, uh, on Pakistan. Uh, the response to an attack has to be proportional to the actual attack. Uh, you can't simply obliterate somebody because they've taken one small act of war uh, toward another uh, state. Um, in terms of the actual limitations of what to do in war, the most important are limitations on weaponry. Uh, 